Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. During this program, you will see examples of two types of radiographs used in the treatment of children. These are the posterior bite wing and the anterior occlusal. The purpose of the program is to demonstrate a sequential approach to the evaluation of the information on the radiograph. In addition, the significant anatomic landmarks will be demonstrated. By this time, you should be able to routinely place a posterior bite wing radiograph in the correct position and the appropriate radiograph mount. If you cannot do this or are unsure, read the section on mounting exposed radiographs in the Pedodonics 642 manual. After you have seen this program, you should be able to identify the primary anterior teeth and any developing permanent anterior teeth on an anterior occlusal radiograph. Identify any area on the anterior occlusal radiograph that deviates from normal. Correctly diagnose abnormalities of tooth size, shape, and number, and the relative position of the teeth on the anterior occlusal radiograph. Differentiate between primary and permanent teeth on a posterior bite wing radiograph based on the morphology of the crown as it is seen on the radiograph. Correctly identify all primary and or permanent teeth on the posterior bite wing radiograph based on the morphology of the crown as it's seen on the radiograph. Identify areas of interproximal caries on the posterior bite wing radiograph. And demonstrate the depth to which caries has penetrated into the crown of the tooth on the posterior bite wing radiograph. The anterior occlusal radiograph is used in dentistry for children because of the large area of the dentition that it includes. Securing anterior periapical radiographs is difficult in the child because of the lack of height of the alveolar process in the region of the anterior teeth and the difficulty of accurate film placement. The anterior occlusal radiograph is easier because it's held between the teeth. With one exposure, the entire region of the maxillary or mandibular anterior teeth is examined. If the vertical angulation of the x-ray beam is controlled, the image of the crown and root of the teeth is very accurate. The most common error is too much vertical angulation of the beam and significant foreshortening of the image of the teeth. Remember, the correct technique for this radiograph suggests that the central ray be made parallel with the plane of the film and then changed through 60 degrees. Two alternatives are suggested for the film sizes. For the preschooler, a number two periapical film is used for the anterior occlusals. For the school age child, the occlusal film packet is used. This large packet is folded and the maxillary view exposed on one half and the mandibular view on the other half of the film. The film is placed so that the fold is on the outside of the mouth and then the incisal edges of both arches project toward the fold of the film. The maxillary anterior occlusal is exposed on one half of the film. Then the child's head position is changed and the mandibular anterior occlusal exposed. Before looking at the anterior occlusal radiograph, the anatomy of the area to be radiographed will be reviewed. This skull is from an individual of about six years of age. It is shown in order for you to picture what you will expect to see on the radiograph of the area. There are eight incisors and four cuspids in the maxillary area to be radiographed. The developing permanent incisors will be above but not over the roots of the corresponding primary incisors. Therefore, the crown of the developing incisors will appear to cover a portion of the apex of the primary incisor root. The developing permanent lateral incisor will be in a similar relationship with the primary lateral incisor. However, because it is slightly higher in relation to the permanent central incisor and behind the developing central incisor, it will appear to cover the primary incisor root less than the central incisor covers the root of its corresponding primary tooth. The permanent cuspid teeth develop high in the maxilla 
and are labial in relation to the developing permanent lateral incisor. Therefore, the permanent cuspid teeth will project near the border of the anterior occlusal film. Also, they will appear above and to the side of the developing lateral incisor on the radiograph. In some situations, particularly where the dental arch is very narrow and the permanent teeth large, the cuspid may be barely visible on the anterior occlusal radiograph. Included in the radiograph will be the nasal chambers, the median palatine suture, the profile of the nose, and the nasopalatine foramen. This is an anterior occlusal radiograph of a four-year-old patient. Look for the landmarks described previously. Because of their morphologic characteristics and position, the primary central and lateral incisors should be quickly seen. The primary cuspids are present, but their image is distorted because the film could have been inserted in the mouth slightly further and the vertical angulation of the x-ray beam increased about five degrees. The tips of the permanent cuspids are visible on each of the top edges of the film. The permanent central incisors are flared slightly. The mamelons are apparent on the incisal edges of the permanent central incisors. The median palatine suture is identifiable on the film, as is the nasopalatine foramen. Examine this mandibular anterior occlusal from the same patient. Can you identify the primary cuspids? Do you see the permanent cuspids? The mamelons on the permanent incisors are very prominent in this patient. You should be able to see the entire length of the incisor roots. The apical portion is superimposed with the image of the developing permanent tooth. This is an anterior occlusal radiograph taken by using a folded occlusal film packet. With the fold of the film oriented in the proper direction when the radiograph is exposed, the incisal edges should project as they are viewed here. This patient is five years old. You should be able to identify all of the primary incisors at age five, and all of the permanent incisors should be developing. The primary cuspids are seen here on this radiograph. The developing permanent cuspids can be identified here by their position on the radiograph and the morphology of the visible crown. Because of the chronological age of the patient, and because the rest of the dentition included in the radiograph corresponds to a patient with a dental age of five years, it is reasonable to make the diagnosis of congenitally absent maxillary lateral incisors. The median palatine suture and the nasopalatine foramen can be identified on the radiograph. The mandibular anterior occlusal radiograph of the same patient is an acceptable anterior occlusal radiograph. It is not unusual for a patient to be missing several permanent teeth. Can the mandibular permanent central and lateral incisors be identified on the radiograph? The permanent cuspids are identifiable in the lower corners of this film. The four permanent incisors can be seen on the film in a normal position. The central incisors are slightly rotated, which accounts for the oblique view of the crown that can be seen. This anterior occlusal radiograph was taken on a six-year-old patient. It shows some of the common errors that make this a poor quality radiograph. The film was placed with the fold in the correct position, but the film was placed in the mouth too far, and the incisal half of the crown of the incisors was not included. The mandibular anterior occlusal was also placed too far in the mouth, but additionally, the vertical angulation was too great and the roots of the primary teeth and the crowns of the permanent teeth were so foreshortened that the film is not acceptable. Viewing the maxillary anterior occlusal film again, you should be able to identify the six anterior primary teeth. The permanent cuspids are difficult to see on this film, but are located in this region. The crown of the left permanent lateral incisor is rotated about 45 degrees. The cingulum and the labial surface can be identified on the almost profile view. Do you see any other anomalous development or pathology on the radiograph? 
there is a supernumerary tooth on the radiograph which you should have identified. The entire crown and root of the extra tooth can be outlined on the radiograph. The supernumerary tooth is inverted and is located in the midline. This could be diagnosed as an inverted supernumerary tooth or an inverted mesiodens. The posterior bite wing radiograph is a useful radiograph for the diagnosis of interproximal caries in the primary and young permanent dentition. Of the criteria for acceptability, the absence of overlap of contacts is important. The enamel is very thin on the primary molar crowns and even a small amount of overlap can distort caries that may be present interproximally. It is good to develop the habit of checking a radiograph each time you view it to make sure that it's mounted properly. Radiographs are always mounted with the raised portion of the dot facing the viewer. By this time, knowing the anatomic difference between the maxillary and mandibular molars, you should have no trouble recognizing if a posterior bite wing is oriented correctly. The mandibular primary second molar is significantly wider than the maxillary second primary molar. The plane of occlusion curves slightly upward and the upward curvature of the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible should be clues that will help orient the film in the correct manner. As you view the radiograph, attempt to identify the teeth present. The difference between a permanent tooth and an adjacent primary molar should be readily seen. The enamel of the permanent tooth is about three times thicker than the enamel of the primary tooth. The mesiodistal width difference between the primary and permanent tooth is another significant difference. Because the permanent molar is wider buccolingually than the primary molar, the permanent molar will appear on the radiograph as more radiopaque. This is a posterior bite wing radiograph of a four-year-old patient. The film is of acceptable quality and useful for the diagnosis of interproximal caries. In order for the patient to be able to hold the film more comfortably in his mouth, the corners of the film are folded as described in the manual. Occasionally, these folds will result in a black line on the film in one or more of the corners. This artifact is acceptable because it does not distort the useful area of the film. The mandibular first permanent molar is present in the lower corner of the film. Look at the thickness of the enamel on the mesial of the tooth and compare it with the thickness of enamel on the mesial of tooth K. You should see that enamel on tooth K is about one-third the thickness of the enamel on tooth number 19. This bite wing radiograph shows the presence of only primary teeth that are erupted. The correct letter designation of these teeth is shown. Begin with the distal cervical of tooth J and follow the contour of the tooth and look for a break in the enamel contour of the tooth. This is evidence of caries. You should follow the enamel contour smoothly from the distal of J across the occlusal and down the mesial of J and then move on to tooth I. Continue this sequential pattern until you've examined all of the tooth surfaces. After examining all of the tooth surfaces, you should have determined that there are no caries on any of the interproximal surfaces on this radiograph. The right side radiograph of the same patient shows an amalgam restoration in place in tooth T. The artifacts from folding the film can be seen as well as a corner of tooth number 30. Use the same sequential strategy that was used on the left side film to examine this radiograph. Determine the teeth present and if there are any decayed teeth. Here is the answer for the identification of the teeth present on this radiograph. You should have seen that tooth A was not present on this film. There is one decayed surface on this film. Did you find it? It is S, surface two. This area of caries is just below the contact area and has penetrated the full thickness of enamel and is just beyond the dentino-enamel junction. A common error in viewing radiographs of the primary dentition is to label this area as caries. Anatomically, 
This area is the mesial developmental depression, which is very pronounced on the mesial surface of both maxillary and mandibular first primary molars. This is a normal appearance of the first primary molar on a radiograph and should not be confused with pathology. Examine this posterior bite wing radiograph carefully. Can you identify the teeth present on this film? Are there any caries? Here is the answer. Compare this radiograph with this radiograph. Do you see the difference? You should be able to see two areas of interproximal caries and possibly one area of occlusal caries. The distal of tooth S and the mesial of tooth T are carious. You should be able to see the break in the enameled surface at both places. Caries on the occlusal of the tooth will appear the same or nearly the same as caries on the occlusal one-third of the buccal or lingual surface of the same tooth. Because these surfaces can be easily inspected during the visual examination, the diagnosis of caries in these areas is not important from the radiograph. When caries is identified in these areas, it is reasonable to check the radiograph to see how far the caries has penetrated into the crown of the tooth. If you look carefully at the crown of tooth A here, there is an area of caries. If a surface 5 and a surface 6 had been diagnosed as caries during the visual examination, then it could be determined from the radiograph that this caries has penetrated well into the dentin. This is a posterior bite wing radiograph taken on a seven-year-old patient using a number two posterior bite wing film. Notice that the occlusal plane appears very straight without the upward curve that was described as a mounting criterion earlier. Look at the mesiodistal width of the second primary molars. There is a difference in the width of these molars. They're shown in the proper position. Notice also that the upward curvature of the anterior portion of the ramus of the mandible can be seen as a landmark for mounting this radiograph correctly. Can you identify the teeth that are erupted? Here is the answer. The contact between tooth T and 30 has been overlapped and it may be necessary to secure a supplemental bite wing to open this contact you should be able to identify several areas of caries on this radiograph. Here is the answer. There are caries on A, surface 1, B, surface 2, S, surface 2, and T, surface 1. The caries on B surface, 2, is past the dentino-enamel junction and into dentin. The caries on S, surface 2 and T, Surface 1 is also well into dentin. Remember, the goal of this program is not to make you proficient at the diagnosis of caries on the television screen. It is the goal of this program to demonstrate the strategy that you should use to diagnose caries on a radiograph and to identify the teeth on the radiograph accurately. The areas that show caries on the radiograph selected for this program are areas that are moderate in depth typical in the location of the caries on the clinical crown of the tooth and easily demonstrated even on the television screen. Actual training in the diagnosis of caries is best accomplished in a seminar or in the examination of many sets of radiographs in a supervised clinic setting. In order to review the material that has been presented during the program, look at the following three radiographs. The correct technique for securing an anterior occlusal radiograph with the large occlusal film packet is to fold the film and place it in the mouth with the fold outward. Looking at this radiograph, would you say that the anterior occlusal radiograph was exposed with the correct technique? The answer is no. Remember, when the anterior occlusal radiograph is exposed with the folded edge of the film facing outward, the incisal edges of the maxillary and mandibular incisors will project toward the fold of the film. This radiograph was exposed with the folded edge of the film inside the mouth, or the reverse of the proper film placement.
This radiograph was exposed with the film placed properly. The angle of the X-ray beam was too great, and there is foreshortening of the roots of the mandibular incisors, which is not acceptable. The maxillary film is acceptable and shows all of the features that have been described. Identify the primary anterior teeth that are present. Then identify the permanent anterior teeth that are erupted or developing and unerupted. Is there any anomalous development or pathology shown on this radiograph? Here is the answer. First, the primary teeth present are teeth C, D, G, and H. The permanent teeth, number 8 and number 9, are erupted. Tooth number 10 is here, and the permanent cuspids, number 6 and 11, can be partially seen here. Is there anomalous development? Yes, tooth number 7 is congenitally absent. This posterior bite wing radiograph was taken on a four-year-old patient. A number zero size film is the appropriate film for this radiograph. One feature of the technique for securing this radiograph is to fold the corners of the film slightly to allow for easier film placement. Also, the film can be placed far enough forward in the mouth so that the distal one half of the primary cuspid will be included on the film. Folding the corners also makes the film impinge less on the lingual and palatal mucosa. Do you see any evidence that these folds were made? Yes, they were made as evidenced by the artifacts on the film corners caused by the folding. These artifacts are acceptable because they do not distort the interproximal areas. Identify the teeth that are present on the radiograph and determine if any of the interproximal surfaces are carious. The patient is four years old, therefore you should not expect to identify any permanent teeth as being erupted. Here are the correct letter designations. There are six carious interproximal surfaces that can be diagnosed from this radiograph. They are A, surface 1, B, surface 2, R, surface 2, S, surface 1, S, surface 2, and T, surface 1. The most difficult surface to diagnose was A, surface 1. If you follow the contour of the enamel in the interproximal, there is a definite break in the enamel contour. Because of the television picture, the depth of the carries cannot be demonstrated on A, surface 1. However, on all of the other surfaces, the penetration is to and past the dentino-enamel junction. The purpose of this program has been to demonstrate the sequential approach to the examination of two common radiographs used in pedodontics. Two techniques for securing the anterior occlusal radiographs have been reviewed. Posterior bite wing radiographs were shown to give an opportunity for drill and practice in the identification of interproximal caries using a sequential process to examine the tooth surfaces. This program is not considered to be the extent of training in radiographic diagnosis of caries. In order to become proficient, considerable practice is needed viewing actual posterior bite wing radiographs in a clinic setting, as well as instruction using projected radiographs to show common location of incipient caries in the primary and young permanent dentition. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.